I'll first be talking about cardiac physiology. The heart is a pump which must circulate blood through two different but interconnected vascular systems. The smaller of these systems is the pulmonary system. Blood returning from the upper part of the body is delivered to the right atrium of the heart by the superior vena cava, one of the body's two largest veins, while blood returning from the lower part of the body is delivered to the right atrium by the other major vein, the inferior vena cava. Contraction of the right atrium in each cardiac cycle forces blood into the right ventricle. This is followed by contraction of the right ventricle, which pumps blood into the pulmonary artery, sending it on through the blood vessels of the lungs. As the right ventricle contracts and pressure within the right ventricle rises, the tricuspid valve situated at the opening between the right atrium and right ventricle shuts, preventing any backflow. The pressure generated by contraction of the right ventricle soon opens the pulmonary valve and blood enters the circulation of the lungs. After passing through the circulation of the lungs, the blood, having been recharged with oxygen and having rid itself of carbon dioxide, is returned through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium. The left atrium, too, contracts, forwarding blood into the left ventricle in order to fill it before it contracts. As the powerful left ventricle contracts, the mitral valve shuts, preventing backflow into the left atrium. The aortic valve opens and blood is forced into the aorta, which distributes it to the rest of the body apart from the lungs. As the contraction comes to an end and pressure in the aorta falls, the aortic valve snaps shut to prevent backflow into the left ventricle. So basically in an aquatic environment, as I stand here in a non-aquatic environment, fundamentally I've got blood pooling in my extremities, uh, my diaphragm is flat, my abdomen is kind of protuberant, uh, <laughs> and uh, essentially I've got negative pressure in my atrium, negative pressure in my pleura, the negative atrial pressure facilitates venous recovery. The negative pleural pressure facilitates inspiratory activity. And what happens during immersion is for, so negative pleural pressure, negative atrial pressure, negative flat or flat diaphragm, all of which facilitates respiration on land. Blood's pooled in my belly, pelvis, lower extremities. What happens during immersion fundamentally is hydrostatic pressure of the water starts scrooging blood upward and eventually it pushes it up inside the pelvic vessels into the abdomen. Uh, that increased abdominal pressure starts to dome up the diaphragm, compresses the pelvic vessels, and ultimately as water level rises above the diaphragm level, much of that blood is pushed up into the thoracic cavity, and of that two-thirds goes into the lungs and one-third goes into the heart. The lungs contain more blood, it's harder to breathe, uh, the body works harder to respire, uh, venous compression uh, increases the heart rate size and blood gets redistributed to the brain, the kidneys, and to the muscles. The net of it all is that fundamentally central blood volume increases and it increases in a male uh, about 70, 70 cc's uh, of as as central as cardiac volume increases by about a third. The heart really has clear awareness of that and a start and starts to increase stroke volume about 35 percent. As a consequence of some of that the heart rate decreases because with increased stroke volume, I don't need that much oxygen circulating to my tissues and so heart rate can drop. But the net of it all is that the increase in stroke volume, even augmented or uh, uh, contradicted somewhat by the decrease in heart rate, increases cardiac output about 30% at rest with neck depth immersion. In working with athletes, uh, and again, this is old news for some of you. The heart really has a couple of jobs. Its main job is to pump blood. 
but it also is an intrinsically important endocrine organ. It also is an important sensory organ, and it basically sends signals up from the heart to the brain stem and does some important things of which we'll speak momentarily. But in working with Olympic level athletes, one of the things that I had to combat as I was trying to rehab them in a pool was the fact that they couldn't get their heart rates up. And they're so used to seeing their heart rates as the measure of cardiac activity. Well, the reality is heart rate is a relatively poor proxy of fitness. It certainly is a measure of exercise intensity, but it has very little to do with fitness. The heart has two ways of pumping more blood. It can beat faster, or it can beat more stroke volume per beat. As, a, as at the beginning of the, of the systolic cycle, the myocardium basically has to do a lot of work to raise intraventricular volume of blood to the point where it is capable of snapping open the aortic valve. And so it's doing all of this compressive work to try and raise the pressure high enough to snap open the aortic valve, but at that point, Essentially, the whole ventricular volume is exposed to the inertial force of all of the arterial tree blood volume, and blood is a viscous substance. So it takes a lot more work to get that moving. So there's a huge energy output at the beginning of the systolic cycle when there's no blood moving at all. And then we're in the sweet spot of contraction and the ventricle and the myocardio, myocardiocytes contract and contract and contract until they're almost completely contracted. And then it's trying to sustain the pressure still to keep things moving. But it's doing so around a very small volume of blood. So if you look actually at energy consumption in the myocardiocytes with each cycle, there's a big energy increase at the beginning when there's no blood moving, and there's a significant energy consumption at the end when there's very little blood moving. So efficiency actually is increased with stroke volume because all of those same forces come into play if I'm beating fast. And the consequence of that is that why do we have an upper limit on heart rate that is irrespectively independent of training? Because above a heart rate of about 200, you're consuming all of this myocardial energy and moving no blood. There's not enough time for blood to get back inside the ventricle, and it becomes extremely inefficient. And so even in a highly trained athlete, even in the most ultimately trained Olympic athlete, heart rates are relatively fixed at a maximum level. What I would tell my Olympic athletes, basically, to get through this process is to say, what is your resting heart rate? And they very proudly say, oh, 38, 42. Well, the reality is, if you show up, if any of you guys just randomly showed up in the emergency room with a heart rate of 38 or 42, you would be slapped onto an IKG, EKG thing and taken up to the CCU because it's not capable of sustaining cerebral circulation unless you've got that kind of a stroke volume capacity and that kind of cardiac output. So what you really want in terms of looking at fitness is a measure of cardiac output. And there ain't any way to do that clinically unless you're doing complex stuff. You can't measure it at bedside. 